Razbani for IFL TV in association with MTK Global. Edward, Hearn, how are we? How are you, mate? Long time no see. You know, I thought they might... Uh, nice to see them sending the big boys this week for our world title card. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, Mike. Took a bit of a sabbatical away. Had a little baby boy myself. So... In the, in the midst of the pandemic, so I decided, let's leave Should boxing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, f- before we touch on this card, Ed, just quickly, um, fresh from Texas last week, Saturday, an unbelievable fight between Estrada and Chocolatito. Um, a lot of people still think, I saw Dan Raphael tweet today, I still can't get over the fact yeah. that Chocolatito didn't get the result. Yeah, he's gone a bit He's gone a bit crazy. I mean, look, I did feel that Chocolatito edged the fight. I felt like the 12th round was quite a big round for him and... You know, but 115, 113, 114, 114, I can get what you can't get again is 117, 111. And, and sometimes when one of those cards is thrown up, it, it sort of it stresses people out. It makes them go completely the other way. It's a robbery. I don't believe the decision was a robbery. I think it was a close fight. But I do also feel that most people thought Chocolatito edged the fight. Do you feel we see a trilogy? I'd like to. I mean, look, we have Rung Visai who must get his opportunity at a world title. We represent him as well. But I kind of feel like it's one of those situations where you could announce another fight for both, but people would be disappointed if, if it's not them fighting each other again. I think whenever you go through a, a tough fight like that, a war like that, you know, you have to ask, do you both want to do it again? Funnily enough, like, Estrada seems really open to the third fight. I've not spoken to Chocolatito himself. I've spoken to his team, and I think we'll see if he wants the rematch uh, number three sorry and I guess he will but I was quite surprised that Estrada sort of openly said I guess that's the you know the Mexican warrior in Emil Gallo that sort of says the fans want it I'm ready to do it again and uh, if we can do number three it'd be fantastic what do you make of the WBA decision to obviously suspend the official I I think it's always good to to move at pace on something like that right so no one's ever going to agree with everything that the, w, the WBA or the WBC do. And they do a lot of great things. They do a lot of things I don't agree with. But moving at pace at something like that is important. I think uh, not having a pop at the British Boxing Board of Control, but, but really they outed one of their own, the WBA. And it's never nice to do. And the, board have a, the British Boxing Board have a kind of a tendency to back their own till the absolute hill. And you have to admire that at the same time. But sometimes, you know, when, when something's got to be looked into, I mean, I believe Sucre, who just, I know Carlos Sucre, I bet. He's, he's judged at many our events. He's a very nice man. He's a, he's a boxing guy. But he scored five, the last five rounds, I believe, to Estrada. The 12th round was so clear for Chocolatito, you know. And, and I think the WBA have come out and said, we've got to look into it. The problem is it goes back to scoring subjective. So when you sit down with someone and say, explain your scores there and they explain it with their interpretation it's quite what do you do you go well I don't agree with you well that's what I saw I've been a judge for 20 years and that's how I saw the fight well I don't agree but again it's like the Kiko Martinez um, fight with Zelfa no one scored it like that do you know what I mean that's the problem so I think we need a little bit more consistency and well done to the WBA for at least going through the process of, of trying to get an explanation as to why that card existed. But in reality, Suka could just go and work for another governing body, couldn't he? Maybe. I mean, again, it's, I don't know, it, it's difficult, isn't it, with a subjective... What I don't like is, I mean, ultimately, one guy had it 115-113 for Estrada. I can see that. So he had it by two rounds. This guy had it by six rounds, OK? What I, what is really bad is when there's like a 12 round swing. You know, I look at a card like, I don't know, uh, Ritson Vasquez, for example, where one guy's give it to Ritson by six rounds, Terry O'Connor, and the other guys give it to Vasquez by six or something like that. It's like, how do you get there? Um, so this is, we're constantly evolving in that respect. And as long as they're held accountable for, for what is perceived to be a poor decision or have to explain themselves, I think it's, it's good moves. Lawrence Okoli, um you're signing from debut. Mm. Um, Anti Joshua signing from yeah. debut. He's Anti Joshua's first kind of protege, almost um, taking on Glowacki, who has been in there with some tough, tough individuals. But a lot of people have Lawrence favourite for this fight, and rightly so because of age, exper- well, not experience, but age and freshness. Freshness is a good word. Um, 
But do you see Glowacki causing any problems? Yeah, I think it's a 50-50 fight. I mean, you only got to look at the resume of Glowacki. I mean, he lost, I think he mainly got hit after the bell, didn't he, against Bradis and got taken out and it was a controversial stoppage. He lost on points to Usyk. You know, he's beaten Marco Hook. Lawrence has never boxed anywhere near those kind of levels. So we're either right or wrong about Lawrence Okoli. He's either the real deal and he could go in there and destroy him and make a major statement, or he could get knocked out. But this is where you find out. You know, it's always a proud moment when you take a fighter from a professional debut to the world championship. Um, and, and also a proud moment for Anthony Joshua and 258 because this is their first managed fighter that could they could take from the debut to a world championship. So everybody's behind Lawrence. They seem so confident. I mean, I heard them laughing and joking and it's a good and a bad thing. You know, I think if I'm Glowatsky, I'm looking at this guy thinking, cool, you're, you know, you're full of confidence or you're, you don't realise what's about to come on Saturday. This is going to be a really tricky fight. Southpaw, experience, can punch, he's got a good chin. You know, this isn't no disrespect to you know, some of the other opponents. So this is where we find out. And I'm really excited to find out. And hopefully Britain can have another world champion on Saturday. I know there's been a lot of negative towards us about his style constantly hugging in the ring etc but he has shown major improvements under Shane McGuigan his last fight was a, an echo to that I think there's two things behind that number one is he hits so hard that when people get up close to him they want to hold on for dear life number two I don't think he had the experience to fight on the inside or work his way out and, and I think Shane's been getting him, getting him not to hold and you saw that against Jezuski. I mean, he looked really, really good. His feet were great. You know, up, up close he was working and he was going back into range. Um, and I don't think you can afford to just hold against someone like Glowatsky. I don't think he will, Lawrence. Um, but Glowatsky's a, a seasoned fighter. You know, he's going to know the tricks, how to work him up close. And I think that's what no one's been able to do. Lawrence is difficult to get hold of. He ties you up. He's strong on the inside. He punches very hard at range. He hits you from awkward angles. But Glowatsky's seen it before. He's boxed Usyk. You know, went 12 rounds with Usyk. So this guy, he's boxed at a high level. I don't believe, though, he's experienced the power yet of Akoli, even with Bradis, because I believe Akoli punches harder than Bradis. I think pound for pound, he's, he's very heavy-handed. I spoke to Akoli, and I said to him, a, num- a little while ago, you said you wanted to become the Cruiserweight World Champion and then move up. Now, with Shaney saying he wants you to unify. Now, ideally, in your scenario, what would you like to see him do. We've obviously got that new weight now, bridge weight, so he could potentially go bridge weight before heavyweight, or does he stay at cruiserweight after this fight, no, if I, successful? Yeah, I think if you win a world title at cruiserweight, you've got to look to unify as, as quickly as possible. I mean, you've got Gulamar in, you've got Bradis probably will vacate the other stuff, you've got Makabu, I actually spoke to earlier on a FaceTime, WBC champion. Um, for me, as long as Lawrence can stay healthy and strong at cruiserweight, pick up the other belts you know I do see him inevitably move into heavyweight in the next 12 months um, but we could all be deluded you know we could it could all unfold on Saturday night and we've seen in there you know I've probably got some of the wildest memories in these behind closed door events because you know just you just never know it's a strange environment in there and anything could happen and he may just be out of his depth or he may be the real deal what we believe him to be and he may make a major statement a uh, quick word on the undercard. Fowler returns, Cordina mm-hmm. returns, Rama Ali's back, uh, Ellie Scott needs back as well. You've got um, given up Chris Billum Smith. Smith. You've Ray given up yeah. obviously Cutler and, yeah. and Ray as well. So a uh, good little mix of fights. Yeah, it's a really good card. I mean, I think Fowler's got a real tough fight against Forte. He's IBF number 15, moves really well, just boxed the IBF number one, went 12 rounds with him in Vegas. You know, no disrespect to Adam Harper, who I love. You know, this is a massive step up for Fowler in comparison. Brilliant fight with Chris Billum Smith. I think that could be a sleeper on the card. Vasil Duke has been slung in time and time again against Igorov, against Lorena, you know, as, a, as a, a novice. Really tough, can punch. I love these cruiserweights who like to stand and, and trade. Joe Caldina, tremendous to see him back. He's got a tough fight against Korbanov. And two really good female fights as well. Ellie Scott Lee against Ganglov and Ramler Ali against Beck Conley. It's a tough fight for a second fight out. And Ray against Cutler's a banging fight. That's going to come on Facebook early on in the night. And good to see those smaller hall guys, those ticket sellers, get the opportunity on the big stage. And that's going to be a part of a really big night. Away from the show, I know Coogan spoke to you a couple of days ago, so I try not to repeat some of the questions he asked you. But uh, announced yesterday, uh, talk to me about this £2 coin in Gibraltar. Yeah. It didn't look too much like Dylan White, in fact. Yeah, no, it's, um, I think it's, it's an honour, really. You know, This event's been really difficult 
to stage in, in a short time period. Dillian White really wanted fans. He was stuck in Portugal as well because of the travel restrictions. So we made the move. We're still, you know, we've got a big task ahead going into next week. Um, but Gibraltar are really excited about it. You know, we'll have 500 fans back in there as well. And they've, they've produced a commemorative £2 coin that will be with us forever. So it's big for Dillian White. You know, you've got your face on a bit of currency. He's up there with the Queen, isn't he? So um, massive fight next week. Massive. Nervous, excited. You know, it's just absolute must win for Dillian White. And looking forward to getting out to Gibraltar for the event. Is it true that you're going to be staying on a yacht? No. Oh, Sunborn yacht. Yeah, yeah. But you made it sound like it's like, you know, some kind of private... 80, 90 metre yacht. It's a hotel. That, you know. It's a hotel on a yes, yacht, yes. basically. Uh, yeah, but not, it's not like a private yacht. It's more of a cruise liner, I guess. Something completely different. Yeah, it's going to be a wild week. AJ Fury, um, I know you've talked a lot about the fight. There's this stipulation that things have to get sorted in the next 28 days. But the world is still sceptical about this fight even taking place this summer. I know you've come out and made some, said some things that, no, it will, we are planning for the summer, but is it likely that, is there a chance that this fight may just fall in the winter? I don't think so. I mean, look, it all depends on, you know, how happy the fighters are. We've already had some, some big offers come in from the sites. We've been talking non-stop over the last couple of days uh, and actually last week as well because we knew this was inevitable, these conversations to start. We will do our work with our partners and, and approaches. They will do their work. We'll convene. We'll present it to the fighters. Everybody's signed up for this fight to take place in the summer. So no one's sort of working towards this fight later in the year. We know that, of course, people would prefer probably to wait a little bit, you know, and get the world back in order. That's not on the table. What's on the table is a fight in June or July for the Undisputed Heavyweight World Championship. If you're not a player in that discussion, then no problem. But we're not pitching a fight in November, December. We're pitching a fight in June or July. The biggest fight in boxing, one of the biggest sporting events in the world. So that's what we're working towards. And, you know, we're not going to be short of offers, but, you know, the world has changed slightly to, to where it was. But, again, that's, you know, we've, we've faced that for the last year and a half and we've overcome it. So... Looking forward to, to getting it tied up and give everybody the date and the, the news that they want. I'm sure there'll be, you know, hurdles to overcome. We've been overcoming hurdles for the last two months. But as I said to Coogan, we wanted to let people know of the progress that's being made. You know, it's not about keeping things a secret. And you know, one of the things that we've always done is been transparent and interactive with the fans. I want them to be part of the journey and the process. And if I'm going to open my mouth and speak to you and Coogan all the time. I'd rather just tell the truth and, and let you know about the progress, the good news. I mean, don't we think it's tremendous news that all of Team Fury and all of Team AJ have signed for this fight to go ahead? But it's like you live in such a pessimistic, half-empty, glass-empty world of, oh, well, this has got to happen and that won't happen. Why not go, fucking tremendous news, now crack on and seal the deal, get this over the line? That's my mentality. And that's what I'm looking to deliver. Wasn't the plan always that once it is sealed Correct. and yeah. deal, then the so, announcement yeah, we've said that will get made. Yeah. But this still looks like there's some serious obstacles to come across. So shouldn't well, not really. People keep talking about these obstacles. I mean, the obstacle is doing, you know, deciding where we want to go. So, you know, the only obstacles really are how much money is going to be offered and generated. And we know we've had financial offers. So we know it's you know, for both guys, this fight is is huge in comparison to all the other options for them. And, you know, I'm not saying the money's not a consideration for AJ, but this is the fight he wants, right? So he trusts us to go out you know, with 258 and his team to, to do the right deal in the right territory. But ultimately, as he said to me last night, I'll do this in your garden. I want to fight him. I want those belts. This is bigger than just who's going to pay the most money for AJ. Now, I appreciate for Fury, maybe it's different, and he's entitled to do that. So we'll present the best opportunities for both guys, but this is the fight we all want. This is the fight boxing needs, and we will be doing everything we can to get it done as quickly as possible. Like you said, we are in a pandemic um, and a double dip recession at the same time, so if you did delay, does, would there be more money on the table towards the end of the year? Possibly, possibly. But that's not on the table at the moment. But no. would Fury still want to fight Joshua at the end well, of the year? Because otherwise you might have to wait. 
you know, maybe both guys end up having interim rights. And the other important point is, if we don't do this fight next, it's very unlikely to be undisputed. The value of the fight changes to sites because many people want to stage this fight because it's the undisputed heavyweight world championship. AJ wants this fight because it's the undisputed heavyweight world championship. We spend a lifetime in boxing waiting, don't we, for the perfect moment. And as they say, don't wait for the perfect moment, take the moment and make it perfect. How confident are you that this fight does take place June or well July? Because June is what ten weeks away, so guessing that's out of play. June or July doesn't. The, the aim is to book to do these two fights this year. You know, end of June, early July, end of July. That's okay as long as we can do the second fight this year because that's the schedule we want to provide to our man. We know Saudi is probably the front runner because it's been trial and tested, and and it's it'll be risky to go into a brand new territory for the biggest fight in the world. But what about the weather? It's all right, the event will be inside. It's going to be very hot. Um, 45 we've had, degrees? Yeah, we've had approaches from uh, four different countries in the Middle East now. We had a completely bizarre uh, approach yesterday, um, which I might share with you one day. We might end up going there. Um, we've got other people trying to reach out to us to get in. This is, you know, this is up there as one of the biggest sporting events of the year. So we're not going to be short of options and offers. Of course, we want the fighters will want and the teams will want to maximise the revenue for the for the fight and make it happen. So, Saudi, of course, very interested. Um, have told us repeatedly and have told Anthony Joshua they want this fight, and those those conversations are ongoing. So, until this fight isn't actually signed until, does that mean Usyk Joyce is still hanging in the balance because no, look, our, our fight is signed? You know what we got to give to everybody is the date and the venue. Um, the WBO have approved the fight, the fight's been signed and Usyk and Joyce has been approved and ordered for the interim world title. So I'm sure that will go ahead, we will go ahead and um, the winner of our first fight has to fight the winner of their fight and if they don't, the winner of that fight, the interim world heavyweight champion will probably be crowned world heavyweight champion. Did you see Usyk's tweet yesterday? Yeah I did, yeah. I don't know if he put it out or what, you know. Um, I think the big issue at the moment is the splits, you know, the argument over the splits in the first bit. I think um, I think 80-20 is a split that's been discussed because they take the previous purses and put them in comparison to what, and obviously Usyk's been making a lot more money than Joe Joyce, so that's where, and there'll probably be arguments backwards and forwards, but I see that fight going to purse, but, you know, I think Usyk, my conversation with Usyk is he wants to do the fight in Kiev, and I would love to do a fight in Kiev for Usyk, I've always wanted to do that. Joe, of course, will want the fight in the UK, but Joe will be happy to go to Kiev, I mean... You know, I just think that fight should move at speed now because it seems to be more delayed than Joshua and Fury. Canelo, Billy Joe, venue sorted. I said, you, I think you said Friday yes, this week. We'll be announcing on Friday the venue. You know, it's been well documented. It's really between Vegas and uh, and Dallas. Dallas, you know, spoke to Jerry Jones and the team there at the, the Dallas Cowboys in the AT&T Stadium. Seventy thousand will be allowed on May the eighth, which just you know made me fall in love to be honest with you to, it's been amazing doing the Canelo fights but in, we're having to do it in front of 15,000 70,000 in Dallas would be incredible but Vegas is opening up and I love doing shows in Vegas so we'll make a decision ultimately Canelo will, will make that decision um, and that'll be he'll announce that on Friday and then we can give you all the, the venue for Billy Joe and Canelo Canelo said some very generous words about you a couple of days ago in an interview where he called you the best promoter in the world. I saw Devin Haney tweet about 10 days ago. All he wrote was, Eddie Hearn is the best promoter in the world. Why is that, Eddie Hearn? Obviously paying well, don't I? No, I just, I think that for Canelo, you know, a lot of his comments are around attention to detail. You know, the way that we do things, the way that we position the show, the way that we position his brand, you know, the entertainment. I was baffled when Canelo told me that he's never had a decent ring walk. You know, this is like arguably the biggest star in the sport, by far the biggest star in America and Mexico. And, you know, when we gave him a, a great ring walk, he, he, was like, he was like a young kid fighter, you know, like his enthusiasm for it was amazing. Then we switched it up a notch in Miami with Jay Balvin and, and you know, probably the two easiest people that I deal with are Canelo and Anthony Joshua. And they're the two biggest stars in the sport. And we're really transparent in what we do. We never let people down. We never break promises. Um, we always deliver what we say we're going to deliver. And when, you know, 
I always say that it's great to have a, a close relationship with a fighter because you've always got their back. You'll never let them down. And when you hear fighters talk about you like that, it makes you want to push even more. So maybe it's just Canelo trying to get me to, to work even harder for him. But, you know, it's, um, I feel blessed to have the two biggest stars in the sport, you know, AJ and Canelo. I mean, it puts us in a tremendous position. We don't take it for granted. We'll do a tremendous job for them. And it's always difficult when you've got two fighters in a fight. You know, you've got Canelo, you've got Billy Joe. We had Canelo, we had Callum Smith. And, oh, he loved, you know, he's a Canelo fanboy now. And ultimately, I'm trying to give our fighters the biggest opportunities in boxing. You know, I've delivered it for Callum Smith. I've delivered it for Billy Joe. And aligning myself with Canelo is tremendous news for our other talent around that weight class because it's going to mean they're going to get the opportunities to fight him as well. So... At the moment, my relationship with Eddie Reynoso and Canelo Alvarez is, is fantastic. I've got such massive plans for them internationally, you know. And but at the same time, you know, you can't help wanting Billy Joe to, to put in a great performance on May the eighth as well. So the opportunity is there for Billy and whoever wins has a huge future. And hopefully, we can continue working with Canelo Alvarez for a long time. I spoke to you a number of years ago, just around the launch of the zone, uh, when you started to sign fighters, and you found it difficult to reach out to certain fighters because you felt managers and promoters were blocking them from speaking to you. But do you feel, from a personal level, like self satisfaction now that you are working now with Canelo Alvarez, and he's clearly said, "I want to work with him as long as I potentially can." So, do you feel yourself personally? I think you just got to trust the process, haven't you? You know, I think if you believe in yourself. Um, you believe you'll get there. And America's been a bumpy ride for us, you know, not just being blocked, as, as you said, but then the pandemic. And now we emerge in a fantastic position, you know, DAZN in a brilliant position, um, doing great numbers, um, you know, through the Callum Smith fight, through the Yildirim fight, with an unbelievable schedule, unrivaled schedule. Um, we have a better reputation than anyone in boxing right now in America. You know, we have the biggest star in America campaigning for us, saying, you know, we're, we're the team to join. Devin Haney, like you said, his comments. I feel that if you say to any young fighter right now in America, who would you like to sign with? I believe the answer is Matra. And that's been the answer in the UK for many years now. And the plan for us is, is of course, to establish ourselves with global dominance. But to do it in those two key markets is important. And I really feel like the tide has turned and it will continue to turn in America and we will be the dominant force if we're not already um, by the end of this year and I'm excited by the relationships we have with the fighters the schedule that we're putting on with the zone and the opportunities that are in front of us when you fought Callum Smith he came out to uh, some trumpets mm. that sounded like uh, final countdown yeah, was... and he loved it what you did against uh, Yildon was amazing we're seeing. I'm, I'm read today that Trilla are gonna bring out Justin yeah, Bieber. Yeah, so, yeah. so what's your plan for Billy Joe? I don't know. It's tough, isn't it? I mean, I have to say, Canelo did help me with a Balvin link up, um, and I think that you've got to keep, you know, pushing the boundaries, haven't you? And, and people are expecting a wild entrance from Canelo Alvarez, and we'll deliver it on May the eighth. It's going to be a huge show. If he can bring back seventy thousand fans at Dallas, it's going to be a major moment for the sport, and we'll put on a show. Cinco de Mayo weekend. I mean, I'm going to be promoting Cinco de Mayo weekend, Canelo Alvarez, Billy Joe and a unification match. It's a massive fight. And uh, I'm, I'm chuffed to bits. And uh, we'll make sure we put, give you a show you won't forget. Absolutely. Ed, I know you've got to go and there's a lot of people waiting. But uh, some quick fire questions and then you can just rumble them off. Uh, Chisora, Parker, May 1st, any updates? Yeah, we're, we're pretty much there on that. We'll, we'll make an announcement tomorrow evening regarding our May the 1st show. It's a fantastic show. We'll announce four fights. Uh, already made for that card. You bank? Quite possibly. Andrade Williams announced for Florida? Yes, April the 17th, um, back in Miami. Great fight, great fight. I mean, I think the Americans appreciate that fight, but they don't know enough about Liam Williams. I think the Brits know that's a real intriguing matchup. Haney Loma. Um, they obviously had some beef on Twitter. Looks like obviously Haney's going towards Lenaris, but that Loma Chunk fight, can that potentially. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, look, Loma's with ESPN. He said, you've either got to work it out with Bob or wait for me to end my contract with Top Rank uh, or that, for that to expire. And Bob ain't going to be letting that fight happen anytime soon. So listen, looks like Lenares for Haney will announce that soon. And then after that, who knows with Lomachenko? Felix Cash, I saw the poster come out today uh, with Bentley. So obviously he's going to go across to BT and have that fight across on their side. Yeah, as I said, you know, we bid for that fight and we, we lost the bid. So 
Felix had the chance for a European title fight, but I felt this is the fight for him. I think he beats Bentley, and when he does it in style, his stock goes through the roof. So no problems with a fighter boxing on, on BT and Queensbury show. Um, the opportunity, I believe, is the right one, and I think he wins. Craig Richards, Bivol, um, I think Craig said contract signed. Getting there, getting there. Could be part of the May 1st announcement tomorrow. Uh, you mentioned last week you were going to meet up with Amir Khan this week. Uh, have you met up with him? Have you spoken to him? Uh, yesterday, actually, with, with his lawyer. Good chat, and he was ready. You know, he wants a big fight. Doesn't want to come back with a warm up fight, wants to go straight back into a big fight, and we'll keep those discussions going. I know a lot of males have called you all sorts of names in the past, but Clit- 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 Clarissa Shield is calling you a clown nowadays. Yeah, um, she wants the money. Show her the money. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I think that. Um, Clarissa is very outspoken, isn't she? But, you know, I think that there's always the, the topical conversation of women's boxing and men's boxing, and I don't think anyone's done more promotionally than matchroom for women's boxing. It's really not about men's boxing and women's boxing. It's about the commercial value of a fighter. Clarissa just did a pay-per-view, and that ultimately tells you better than any other model in the world the commercial value of a fighter. And that's it. You know, if you want hundreds and hundreds of thousands, you've got to deliver numbers. And if you don't deliver numbers on pay-per-view, you're not worth hundreds and hundreds of thousands. So we will put, you know, I actually had a call with Dimitri Salita and Mark Taffet on Tuesday, I believe. Uh, went very well. You know, they want to try and make the Savannah Marshall fight and hopefully we can get it done. Ed, I know you've announced, well, you haven't announced, but you're going to announce Bitesy for the 15th of May. Are you then going to wait until restrictions are completely lifted before you announce June shows and July shows? just fall in that date, to be honest with you. So, yeah, I think that will just uh, fall into place nicely. Just finally, um, we had sad news this week. Obviously, Marvin Hagler passed away, one of the greatest middleweight fighters mm. that we've had ever in the sport of boxing. So, just uh, find a few words, just if you could share on yeah, Marvin. Tremendous fighter. I mean, you know, a, a great man. I met him a few times. Had the biggest hands I've ever seen. <laughs> like when you shake someone's hands, they're like shovels. Um, you know, a fighter that made it against the odds really you know a, a blue collar fighter uh, someone that didn't have the Olympic background and pedigree and sort of was never really supposed to achieve what he achieved but he found a way he was extremely tough and uh, was involved in some tremendous fights I think went on a was it a 35 fight 36 fight winning streak or something like that and of course his iconic fight with Tommy Hitman Hearns you know, unbelievable fight very tough man tough man strong man and we sadly missed Eddie Hearn, IFL TV, thank you very much. Cheers.